Thanks, Keith. So I think uh, we'll just uh, carry on and uh, we'll ask Mike Stover to talk to us about the extended ephemeral. Are you seeing the... Uh... Yeah, you're great. Okay. So I'm going to give the uh, discussion on the extended ileofemoral approach. I'd like to thank my long-term friends, Mark Riley and Steve Sims, for some of the content in the, the talk. We've all given it a number of times, and I think they've all become one talk over the last few years. So the learning objectives are, why do we use the extended ileofemoral approach? Its indications and contraindications. The technique specifically, we'll go over that for most of the talk. I'll give you a few examples and we'll talk about the complications. In Lettronel's book, he discussed the extended ileofemoral uh, development was prompted by the need to have simultaneous exposure to both supporting columns of the acetabulum through a single incision. Uh, it, it follows a truly internervous plane between the gluteal nerves and the femoral nerve. It's based on the posterior pedicles of the superior and inferior gluteal neurovascular structures and allows access to the joint uh, for assessment of the reduction. So it's a very powerful approach. And really, when do we use it? Uh, when we want to obtain an, when we think that an anatomic reduction is judged to be probably impossible with the use of the ilioingral or the coker langenbach or any of the uh, other uh, approaches developed uh, used uh, uh, alone. So typically the indications are two column fractures, the T-shaped fracture, transtechal transverse fractures with or without a posterior wall and associated both columns. Really the uh, big indication also or major indication for the extended iliofemorals are these older fractures, uh, all of which are two column fractures. And this is really when we may need the exposure into the joint to allow for assessment of the reduction. The contraindications are, of course, advanced age. I think the uh, morbidity of the approach would be challenging to an elderly individual with the, uh, with the elevation of the abductors from the external iliac wing. You want to avoid performing the surgery on uh, patients that may have a morel lavalle or a soft tissue degloving injury along the iliac crest or lateral hip. As we know, this may be in involved uh, or associated with a higher risk of infection. In that circumstance, uh, you could really lose the joint quite quickly and really not have very good reconstructive options. There are some controversies regarding the, its use with a known injury or with a previous embolization of the superior gluteal artery. I think it has to do with how it was embolized or how it was injured, how you assess it. Um, and Letronel discusses in, in his textbook, actually, that interoperative uh, disruption of the SGA has not necessarily been associated with severe complications. And then obesity, again, for the risk of infection is probably a contraindication uh, for the approach, and it's very challenging to do in the obese individuals. So typically, it's in a lateral position or always in a lateral position. I prefer to use an orthopedic table. It does allow for more efficient uh, lateral and distal traction. You can do this through the perineal post or through a distal femoral pin. And it does help us uh, position the femoral head into an appropriate position to reconstruct uh, the bone around it. It also gives you the ability uh, to visualize a little bit better in the joint with some distraction. Uh, alternatively, though, you can just use a regular orthopedic table, radiolucent, of course, and then utilize instead just a femoral distractor across the joint as your traction device. It just doesn't give you as much efficient lateral traction. You typically have to still use a chance pin in the femur to help pull the femoral head out. Letronel described the stages of the approach as the detachment of the origins and insertions of the hip abductors. And this gives you exposure to the iliac wing from the greater static notch to the anterior superior capsule. Second step is to expose the posterior column, which is the uh, coker langenbach uh, type of exposure of the posterior column with release and elevation of short external rotators and exposure of the lesser cytic notch down to the cranial ischium. And then finally doing the capsulotomy. He also described the additional exposure of the internal iliac fossa. This is utilized mainly in fractures that are older or in fractures with a transverse or T-shaped orientation. This gives you a little bit uh, more access to the pelvic brim for reduction maneuvers and also cleaning out the fractures with uh, more delayed fractures. Uh, 
you can limit this to elevation distal to the anterior superior spine. I'll show you a little picture of that in a minute. Uh, but you can elevate elevate the iliocapsularis and even just re release the reflected head of the rectus or the direct head of the rectus. And this will give you exposure all the way over to the iliopectinal eminence down onto the quadrilateral surface for palpation reason, not visualization, but you can actually visualize the fractures as they come above the brim out to the anterior rim and the T-shape or the uh, transverse uh, shapes. Uh, you can release the sartorius and ingual ligament from the anterior superior leg spine. Keith showed an example where you take uh, the ASIS off with a bony block to help maybe improve the vascularity uh, or the uh, maintain the vascularity of the anterior superior leg spine uh, during that approach. Uh, Joel Matta discussed that if you do have fractures that go up to the crest, uh, that elevation of the, or release of the, of the sartorius or inguinal ligament can put at risk uh, devascularize in this area because this separates it from the uh, perforators into the ilium more posteriorly. And probably you should maintain at least the rectus on and the anterior capsule on that anterior fragment if you do this with fractures that extend to the crest and, and a, uh, associated both column or anterior plus posterior hemi transverse. But this release, I've only used it really for delayed fractures uh, in order to help clean the area and more commonly with a transverse uh, segment. So here's the kind of exposure you can get with the release of the uh, tenotomy of the rectus off the anterior inferior spine. You can still use a window up here into the internal iliac fossa uh, for visualization if you have a fracture that goes along the iliac crest and exits highly. Uh, and with the reflected head, cut here, the direct head off. You can elevate all the way down to the psoas gutter onto the iliopectinal eminence, and you can get internal aspect, internal access all the way back to the greater notch and just to the edge of the pelvic brim. And if you limit your dissection back in this area, you won't disrupt those important uh, perforators into the ilium that can result in devascularization. I like to separate the first stage though into three parts. Uh, that's the Smith-Peterson approach, anterior aspect of the hip, followed by the elevation of the abductors, and then release of the abductors from the greater trochan, and this allows you access to the posterior column. So here you can see the uh, initial portion of the elevation. You can see we've already developed the incision over the sartorius. Uh, anteriorly, and now we can start to identify the origin of the uh, tensor fascia muscle all the way back to the gluteus. Here you can see where we have to sharpen yes. to release the. Okay, uh, thank insertion, you. I'll be right there. Insertion of the uh, gluteus maximus onto the crista glutei, which gives us better access into the greater sciatic notch. And here's the interval kind of demonstrated throughout the MRI cuts beginning from anterior and work in our way posteriorly until we're able to elevate the gluteus maximus and medius uh, from the entire iliac crest. So then you uh, proceed to the Smith-Peterson portion of the approach. Uh, this is the, probably the more confusing area for most people. Uh, if you do a lot of uh, anterior hips or anything like that, you may be a little more familiar, but there's this overlying retinacular tissue on the anterior aspect of the hip that needs to be incised. From here, you can identify the uh, ascending branch of the lateral femoral circumflex vessels, the reflected head of the rectus. I think it's also important to identify the anterior uh, or cranial extension of the uh, vastus intermedius or lateralis, as this will really help you identify the gluteus medius tendon, which has to be uh, released as the, as the final portion of that first step. So as you incise your way down, then you'll get an exposure like this. You'll see that the abductors are elevated. We've identified and saved the stump of the minimus. We've released the minimus. And now we prepare keeping the stump of the minimus. And in this circumstance, instead of releasing the tendon, many times what I'll do is a trochanteric osteotomy and release this more posteriorly. For me, this is a little bit easier and maybe a little bit quicker also to uh, perform in this way rather than a tenotomy of the medius tendon. I have a little bit of trouble probably identifying that perfectly on the lateral aspect of the trochanter and then releasing it in the repair is a little bit more uh, 
less reliable for me uh, as far as the uh, finishing up the approach. Finally, we're going to expose the posterior column. That just really is releasing the short rotators from the posterior aspect of the hip, elevating them off of the retroacetabular surface, as you see here, we typically do it. I'll commonly move to the other side of the table and work on the back side of the patient uh, from this portion uh, of the approach for the exposure and reduction of the posterior column. It's just a little bit more comfortable for me to be back in that position uh, where we typically do the uh, posterior approach. And that just gives us a little bit more uh, exposure caudally, I think. And this is where I run into issues with uh, the lateral position because I think it's a little bit more challenging to access that very caudal portion of the, uh, uh, the approach or the cranial aspect of the ischial tuberosity and also to get palpation access or clamp access onto the quadrilateral surface. And finally, you can do the capsulotomy. Letronel described this just a peripheral rim capsulotomy for visualization of your reduction. You can be a little more extensive as long as you're not going to devascularize or detach some of the more cranial portions of the anterior column, where you can actually sublux the joint and uh, take a look at the reduction within the inner aspect of the joint. Uh, this can be modified because you may have some wall fragments or things that you just move out of the way rather than actually doing the capsulotomy itself. So these, for me, are the difficult areas for exposure, the caudal uh, aspect posteriorly near the ischial tuberosity. I see that a lot better through a traditional coker langenbeck approach. Uh, maybe that's just the lateral position. And then, of course, the digital aspect uh, or digital palpation along the quadrilateral surface in the lateral approach or lateral position. So we're going to just go over a few specific fracture types and the indications that we talked about quickly uh, at the beginning of the talk. So in both column fractures, we look at fractures that may have indications for the extended iliofemoral if they have a complex or a segmental uh, fracture of the posterior column, and Keith showed an example of that. These displaced fracture lines that cross the sacroiliac joint are also an important uh, fracture pattern for the extended iliofemoral. I really think this is probably the best way to anatomically reduce uh, each of the fragments. Uh, as Keith talked about it, you can probably get away with some kind of secondary surgical congruence uh, without the extended iliofemoral, so you may want to weigh the risks and benefits of that. Whether there's wide separation in the anterior and posterior columns at the acetabular rim or quadrilateral surface combination. Now, the importance of these are that through a single approach, you're not going to be able to uh, control the contralateral column or the, the opposite column very well uh, through the anterior or posterior approach because we're allow, allow, relying, sorry, on the attachments of the soft tissues or the quadrilateral surface itself to help facilitate the reduction of the opposite column. And if those things occur, whether these wide displacements are seen, you can see them at the, uh, using a CT scan right at the uh, weight-bearing surface. If there's a wide displacement of the anterior and posterior column on the CT scan in a both column fracture, you're not gonna have the soft tissue uh, abilities to help secondarily pull that uh, opposite column over, uh, and then also the quadrilateral surface combination. So here's the typical example of uh, what I use an extended iliofemoral for quite often, and probably the majority of the fractures that I've done it on. And this is a uh, associated both column fracture. You can see the disruption of both columns uh, through the ilioischial line, iliopectineal line. And you'll see that there's a fracture line that goes all the way up into the iliac uh, crest. But more importantly, you'll see this little wedge-shaped fracture fragment right here. And this is what Keith was talking about earlier. Also, uh, is could be or probably is portion of the spur sign. But if you look at the uh, Jude views, you can see here on the iliac oblique, the entirety of the greater cytic notch is a separate fragment. And here you can see that the spur sign is actually truly a free-floating fragment on the iliac, oh, I'm sorry, on the obturator oblique. And so now you don't really have a key to do your typical reduction uh, maneuvers where you're gonna start from here, put this pie piece back onto here, the intact ilium, and then where are you gonna set your anterior column to if you don't have this? And then finally, how are you gonna get your posterior column back into position? 
And this CT scan might be just a little bit younger than the ones Keith showed us. That one had to be vintage 1970, but this one is 1990s, I think, at or early 2000s at Loyola. And here's this fracture fragment that you can see right here. So as you build this now from the outside, you can see how you can piece this together in a way that will allow for anatomic reduction of the joint. So here's the typical sequence starting way back uh, from the intact ilium, bringing the sciatic buttress back into position, moving more forward and sequentially putting the anterior column wedge fracture back into position, and then moving even farther forward to bring the anterior column back into position, and finally using very similar techniques that we use from the posterior approach to bring the posterior column into position. Now, the difference is from the lateral aspect of the ilium, there's different screw trajectories. We use these commonly even with just percutaneous techniques for the pelvic uh, ring or also for acetabular fractures. And so all these are readily available through the lateral aspect of the uh, ilium uh, utilizing the extensor, extended iliofemoral approach. So here's our post-operative x-ray. And I think we can see, you can see where the reconstruction of the greater sciatic notch is and the typical reconstruction with screws and plates. I typically will use plates along the iliac crest of the wedge fracture fragment too, because I'm gonna rely on these fragments here to pull the anterior column back into position. So I'm a little bit concerned if I had just a, a lag screw holding the wedge fracture that I'm placing the clamp onto to bring the entire anterior column back into position. So it's not unusual for me to use uh, some plates along the uh, uh, iliac crest in that situation. And here's what we commonly see is a little bit of heterotopic ossification. Now, how about transverse fractures? Typically, they should be transtectal transverse. So the importance is that these fractures go right through the weight-bearing surface. And we start to lose control of that issue pubic segment or the lower half or free segment. If there's an ipsilateral uh, or the contralateral rami fractures or a symphysis disruption, and sometimes we won't control the cranial intact portion if they have an ipsilateral SI joint injury. And especially if you have central dome impaction, that might be very hard to get to if you don't have an associated posterior wall fracture. So this is what we're demonstrating. Commonly, we like to have this intact symphysis because now we have a rotational control of the anterior or the opposite column through the transverse and also allows us to control the rotation along the horizontal axis. So here's a case example you can see here. You can barely see a loss of congruence of the uh, joint. Here's a fracture through both columns, through the ilioitial line, iliopectineal line. It looks like a rather low fracture on this image, but you can see that there's also contralateral rami fractures and the symphysis dislocation. And if you look at this more closely now in each of the views, this comes in right underneath the uh, anterior inferior spine. So it's a high roof arc angle, anteriorly and posteriorly with the subluxation along the posterior column. So you also can see the symphyseal dislocation on the uh, inlet outlet views. And now you get this uh, example, I'm sorry, this picture of the orientation of the fracture right through the weight bearing surface, a very high transtectal transverse. Now some believe that you can reduce this through an anterior approach. And I think you can control the cranial portion of the transtectal transverse, but it's very hard to close down the more caudal portion uh, without leaving a gap uh, due to your clamp placement within the internal iliac fossa. So in this circumstance, you can use the extended iliofemoral, you can use clamps from the front and from the back and control the caudal portion, even in a T-shaped type of fracture, and then using the screws into the anterior column and plates along the posterior column to help control that. So here's our post-operative x-ray. You can see there are imperfections in the pelvic ring. So the acetabulum takes uh, precedence, of course, so that we're gonna reconstruct the acetabulum put that back together through the extended iliofemoral, then she's put in a, prone, a supine position and we secondarily plate the uh, symphysis to allow for stabilization of the pelvic ring. And here she is actually uh, 12 years post-op with a functional joint. Transverse post-posterior wall, uh, these are the same indications as the transverse uh, with the contralateral uh, injuries or loss of uh, control of the issue of pubic segment. 
but also the posterior wall fracture uh, component is important is that if it's extended or beyond the posterior border of the bone, as you can see here, it comes all the way and passes the posterior border of the bone. Now you don't really have a posterior read for a cochlear langenbach approach. So you're either left with an anterior approach to uh, reduce and stabilize the uh, anterior portion of the transverse, followed by a sequential posterior approach or the extended iliofemoral. Also, a cranial extension is difficult through the cochlear langenbach. This can be dealt with with a greater trochanteric osteotomy uh, or, again, working through a single approach in order to perform the reduction in fixation, especially if there's some associated uh, impaction through the cranial aspect of the joint. So here's an example. This gentleman's in a high-speed motor vehicle crash at associated dislocation, transtectal transverse. You can see here, even on the plane radiographs, he's got central dome impaction and uh, a very complex uh, multi-fragmentary posterior wall. So here's his axial cuts through his CT. You can see the impaction through here, the complexity of the fracture pattern as it goes through the transverse and the multi-fragmentary posterior wall, and the uh, CT demonstrating the same. So due to the uh, imp cranial impaction and the transtectal transverse, uh, we did this also through an extended iliofemoral. Uh, and this is a post-operative x-ray and these are seven years post-op. So he does have some grade two heterotopic ossification, a nice functioning joint, but probably some loss of congruence over the uh, years. The T-shaped fracture, uh, Again, transtectal uh, transverse components, uh, wide displacement of the vertical stem of the T can be an indication, again, because you're gonna have difficulty controlling the opposite side of the fracture through a single approach. Uh, and also if they have the associated dislocations around the pelvic ring, this may be an indication. So here's a very good example of Mark Riley's. This is a symposteal dislocation, SI joint dislocations bilaterally, a wide displacement of the vertical stem of the T. Here's the anterior column component, the posterior column component, both of which are transtectal. And so this would be a good indication to uh, proceed through the same type of approach uh, to the uh, fractures we just demonstrated uh, with the transverse. And then finally, delayed fractures. I think this is important for the art interarticular access because you can confirm the reduction along the cartilage borders because you're gonna have a resorption of the fracture lines that begin at, with the uh, maturation of the callus. And you're also gonna have a hard time mobilizing the fracture fragments, especially in relatively young individuals who are gonna have a lot of uh, bone healing within the first 21 uh, days. So this is an example of a, uh, a, a delayed fracture pattern. Uh, this gentleman was in, involved in a high-speed motor vehicle crash. He seemed to like methamphetamine but uh, he had this high energy injury. And here's his sciatic buttress right here. Here's his anterior column. You can see that the posterior column component is also displaced and he's also got a small wall component on the AP. So he underwent initial uh, embolization at the outside facility. And due to the embolization, uh, he underwent a uh, intrapelvic approach along with a lateral window. He showed up at our institution uh, four weeks post-op these are his initial x-rays. He's non-congruent, he's 18 years old. And so I felt that this was probably a joint that could be salvaged. The CT scans show that the residual displacement was through the posterior column uh, and likely due to secondary uh, positioning or malposition of that sciatic buttress fragment. So we took him to the operating room, removed his implants through the ilioinguinal uh, staged this a week later after healing with an extended iliofemoral. Here's his interoperative imaging, his initial post-op imaging. You can see now his femoral head is congruent. Uh, here's the uh, incisions that we utilized in order to perform this uh, surgery. And here he is now at two years out, probably has a dead piece of the sciatic buttress up here in that he has a non-union of the posterior column but he is asymptomatic. He has no pain functioning at a very high level. Uh, and so he decided not to do anything about this at this point in time. So you can see the power of the extended iliofemoral approach and its ability to uh, obtain excellent reductions in uh, patients with very difficult fracture patterns.
but at what cost? And I think the most common complication, uh, not I think, but we know that the most common complication with the extended ophemeral approach is heterotopic ossification. Uh, Letronel showed and other papers have shown that high grade uh, heterotopic ossification formation, the reduction in risk can be, uh, there can be a risk reduction, especially with the use of endomethacin with or without the use of radiation. You just have to choose whether or not you think that the radiation uh, fits the uh, risk profile for the patient. Uh, infections uh, have not been that common in uh, Letronel's book and in my practice, my very first uh, patient was infected. I've done only 16 of these in my practice in 20 years of practice, so they're not that common. Uh, but if you do have an infection, it's uh, disastrous. It's a very difficult and challenging reconstruction you're probably left with uh, arthrodesis as uh, your bailout. Uh, skin necrosis has not been a problem, but it's been reported. And these last three are typical for probably just a little bit of a mishandling of the soft tissues, uh, where you can end up with neurologic injuries, uh, skin uh, issues, and or vascular injuries. And in Letronel's discussion in his book also, intraoperative disruption of the superior gluteal uh, artery in four cases did not result in a massive uh, slough of the uh, flap. And therefore, it's uncertain what the importance is of that, but there have been case reports also of major sloughs of the uh, abductor uh, flap. So preoperatively, you may want to judge whether or not the patient has an intact superior gluteal artery and that has been described in the literature as well. And preoperative angio may be indicated in that situation. So uh, in summary, it is uh, reserved for many of the most difficult fracture patterns that we encounter. It can be a technically demanding approach, but I think you do it a couple of times on a cadaver and uh, you have good uh, mentors that can help you. Uh, it is an approach that's uh, very important and can be done very safely in most circumstances. It does have the highest overall complication rate, though, of all approaches to the acetabulum, but it's still a very important approach to provide comprehensive uh, treatment of acetabular fractures in a uh, practice. So thank you very much.